But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. If Pete Maravich hadn't played basketball, he might have played Vegas as a sleight of hand artist, either on the stage or at the gaming tables. He could make anything disappear, even a basketball, with his lightning moves. Beyond his ball handling skills, Pistol Pete shot with deadly accuracy, becoming the most prolific scorer in the history of college basketball. A droopy-eyed virtuoso, Maravich was born to entertain. You're looking at Pistol Pete Maravich, in my opinion, the greatest playmaker playing today. Excitement, enthusiasm, greatness. That was Pete Maravich. He was unstoppable. It was as if you had melted down all 12 Harlem Globetrotters and then filled up this skinny 6'6 white frame with everything they had. Everything just stopped. It was like, wait a second. Did he just do what I think he did? You were never quite sure what he was going to do with the ball in the open court because he had a thousand moves to either shoot it or pass it. Uh, give him that much room and he'll burn you. He faked with his right hand like he was going to the player on his left, and he just whiffed it, and then he hit it, tipped it with his left hand to the player on his right. He went in for a layup, and the officials called traveling. And Pete went crazy. He went to the official and said, you can't call that. You've never seen that move before. Nobody handled the ball better than Pistol. But he wasn't just satisfied with that. He had to put a little show on for the fans. I asked him once if he'd ever played a perfect game. He said, no, but I'm going to. So some night I'm going to take 40 shots and I'm going to make them all. He was an entertainer at heart. And his ability to pass the ball and dribble the ball and do outlandish things on the court, which sometimes even overruled the game, that was Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich was showtime before there was showtime. I think that the only problem with Pete Maravich was the four other guys. He just didn't relate to the rest of the team. He was the ultimate outsider. He was the great white player in a black man sport. He was a, an individualist in a team game. He didn't really understand basketball, other than the dribbling ball through his legs behind the back and pass behind the back, which almost everyone could do. He didn't understand the game of basketball. People just salivated by getting him on a one-on-one -on -one situation. He had 250 players in the league that he was going to compete against that were going to try to knock him down every time he put the ball between his legs or did something that was flamboyant. Pistol was way ahead of the game. Pistol got the reputation of being a hot dog because he was so talented that he was bored with the game. People would point fingers at him. Well, he's too selfish. He takes too many shots. That's why they don't win. Drafted by Atlanta in 1970, Pete Maravich entered the pros as a high-dollar, high-profile player whose flamboyant talent belied the pressures that were building within. I can remember him in training camp in Baton Rouge one year when he was with the Hawks and how isolated he was from the rest of the team. Pete was in his own world. With teammates, he was aloof. With opposing players like myself, he was aloof. He just knew of the legend of Pistol Pete, but you didn't know Pete Maravich. 
There was a wild streak in him, and you, you could tell it. The PR man at LSU said, you know something, if he doesn't change, something's going to happen, he'll never live to be 30. He got wrecked in, in, the, in the cocktail lounge, and he's ranting and raving, and of course he jumps up and cracks his head on the table, splits his head wide open. I remember waking up early in the morning to a phone call and heard the girl that I was with talking, and she said, that was my husband on the phone. And I said, your husband? And she said, yes, I'm separated, and so is the other girl. Well, I immediately hollered upstairs for Pete. Finally got him to wake up. I said, man, we got to get out of here. So we got our clothes on, and we're running, and we're starting to go out the front door, and we see this car pulling up, or I think it was a pickup truck, actually, with two guys in it. So we go running. And it was on the second floor already, so we opened this window and we're looking down and it's about a 10 foot, 12 foot drop to the ground. And so phew, we didn't have any choice. Boom, we're out there. I thought about suicide many times in my life. It would have been easy for me. I used to take my Porsche 135 miles an hour across a bridge called the Lake Pontchartrain, Train. Just to air myself out and air the car out. It would have been so easy just to take that wheel and turn to the right. Just about 10 degrees and it would have been history for me. In a lifelong search for stability, Marovich wandered into bizarre realms. He claimed that he believed in visitors from outer space and that on his condo in Atlanta he had gone up on the roof and painted in red paint, take me. UFOs, karate, transcendental meditation, vitamins, fasting, being a vegetarian. He was always searching for some kind of peace that he couldn't find in basketball. He tried to change his personality, and he tried to please so many people that he was a different person all the time. And when that happens, you eventually lose your identity. And that's what happened to Pistol at one point. He lost his identity, and because of it, things start falling apart for him. The seeds of Maravich's eventual disconnection were planted in childhood by a father whose only means of self-expression was a game. I was seven years old my dad sat me down and he said Pete if you'll listen to me you might be able to get a scholarship in basketball because we can't pay your way and maybe you not only get a scholarship but maybe you'll go to the pro level and you'll play on a team that wins a world championship and you'll make a million dollars playing basketball and they'll give you a big diamond ring and they'll have your name on it and say world champions and to a seven-year-old my eyes lit up and I said dad that's what I want he said, if you let me teach you, you just commit. You dedicate your life to basketball, and that's all you have to do. And you'll live happily the rest of your life. And that's what I did. I became a human basketball. I was a basketball android. Pete Maravich's father, Press, grew up in Pennsylvania steel country. Back in Aliquippa, there were, you really had three things. You had the steel mill, you had the family, and you had sports. Press took up basketball from the day he first knew how to bounce it completely obsessed with the game, loved it, played it with all his heart. Press was really known as Mr. Basketball around Aliquippa. If anything, we all looked at him as a basketball hero. After a short professional career in the 1940s, Press moved on to coaching high schools and small colleges. He was very precise in everything he did. He knew what he was doing and he knew what he wanted. And uh, you played for him that way, and you practiced for him that way. Everybody thought Press Maravich as this mock scientist about basketball. I mean, he was so involved in the game, you know, about the fundamental parts of the game and how it should be played. Already a stepfather, when his firstborn son Pete arrived in 1947, Press Maravich charted a course straight to the gym. Chris was talking one time about how some people are born to play a piano, some people are born to be painters, some people are born to be writers. He said that he thought Pete was born to play basketball because he had basketball genes. Pete would come on the court in the backyard and say, let me shoot, give me the ball. And Press would say, no, go back in the house, you're too small. And Press said on one occasion he'd left the ball on the court and went back in the house and looked back through the kitchen window and he saw that Pete had slipped onto the court, picked up the ball and started shooting. And Press says, I knew at that moment I had him. It was like his dad was dangling something out in front of him and would intrigue him and Pete would get interested in it and then his dad would take another step and then another step until he was hooked and he was obsessed by the game of basketball. When he was 12 years old, he opened
opened the window to his room, jumped out of the window, and spent the night in the woods cuddling a basketball. When Press was at the wheel of the car, Pete would sit in the back seat by the window, put the window down, and as Press drove slowly, Pete would dribble the ball. Now, I mean, that's an eerie connection with basketball. In 1956, the Maravich family moved to South Carolina, where Press went to coach Clemson. While he built a reputation in the ACC, Pete was building one of his own, playing on the high school varsity as a 12-year-old. In 1959, he threw a pass between his legs, and the crowd went berserk. It was a small crowd, but they went nuts. And at that time, something clicked in him, very much like any entertainer. When practice was over at high school, he would stay another hour or two, just ball handling and shooting hook shots from half court, stuff like that. He was about five foot, weighed about 80 pounds when he was in the eighth grade. He used to sit out there from 20, 25 feet, shoot from the hip. That's when he got that pistol name. When Press became assistant coach at North Carolina State in 1962, the family moved to Raleigh. At Broughton High School, it was clear that Press's passion had transferred to his son. Pete was always the last one to leave the court. And when Press would be there to pick him up, he would say, well, come on, Pete. And Pete would always put him off. Uh, Dad, I've got a little bit more to work on. You know, I've got something else I need to do. And Press would look at me and he'd say, how about that kid? He said, uh, oh, Jack, uh, the, the world wants this kid. He said, what do you see him play? He said, he's just a marvelous player. He does everything. Sees the floor, makes the pass, can handle, can shoot it long. I said, uh, Press, can he defend? Well, yeah, he can do that, too. The thing that really was impressive that uh, he never took his eye off the basket. I mean, you could turn him upside down and you'd always look at him and his, his eye would still be on the basket. He was in his little dream world on that basketball court. But as we would, you know, venture out and, and go to clubs and stuff like that, he would be tagging along behind. When I knew him in high school, he was this jittery, jerky kind of a guy, the kind of guy that, a, you know, probably some psychologist today would have him on Ritalin. You know, he, he was probably just too jerky. He couldn't concentrate. He couldn't sit still. Trying to be friendly to Pete was kind of hard because he would, he would start looking down and moping around. He wouldn't really care, in particular, if there were girls involved. While Pete led Broughton to the state semifinals in 1965, Press, in his first year as North Carolina State's head coach, won the ACC tournament. Father and son stood together on the brink of a dream. Press was determined to coach Pete. All of us who knew Press knew that that was his lifetime goal, to coach Pete in college. But unfortunately, he didn't hit those books as hard as he should have when he was a young man. Consequently, he didn't quite make the grade on the SATs. While Pete spent a year at a nearby prep school, his father let it be known in the college coaching fraternity that a package deal was possible. He didn't have to wait long. Press was making around $12,500 as head coach at NC State, and I think he got around $15,000 to go to LSU. And Pete wasn't accepted at NC State, so both of them, you know, they go to LSU, and then it's history from there. I can remember the first day I saw Press Maravich at a press conference at LSU. The first one he had as the coach. And before he got halfway through, he said, boy, there's going to be a guy next year at LSU who's going to be the greatest basketball player in the world, my son, Pete. I think one of the toughest sells in America was to sell basketball in Louisiana. It wasn't until Pete showed up on campus and started playing that, I mean, it was like the word spread like wildfire, that here was a bona fide superstar. And it'd be five, 6,000 people would show up for the freshman game just to see him. And then they'd have the varsity game and it would be like six, 700. After averaging 44 points on a freshman team that lost just once, Pete joined his father on the LSU varsity in 1967. In his first game, he took 50 shots. Pete was there to bring in the people. Pete was there to, to do the scoring. And we were there to do whatever we could to help that along. Press recruited players, at least in my opinion, that had the body to set good screens. And Pete was very good at stepping around those screens. 
And somebody asked me what it was like trying to guard Pete. I said, imagine yourself in a big, dark, pitch black room, and they put you in there, and it's full of refrigerators, and there's a house fly in there, and they try you to try to catch it. You run around, you keep running into all these big refrigerators, you don't see them, and boom, 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 and it's impossible to even try. As soon as he touched the ball, people went to the edge of their seat. And there was this great rumor that was circulating that he had developed a shot that he was going to dribble down the court and right before the basket, give it a hard dribble and the ball on a bounce would go in the basket. People of Pete Maravich's generation all wanted to play basketball like he did. Guys were in the low-cut sneakers and the, the trim white socks and the, the tight-fitting pants. And Pete showed up with his hair flopping all around, and he had these ugly old high sweat socks that just flopped all over the floor. The pistol and his pop. The pistol and his pop. The pistol's done and gone and shot his way up to the top. He's played his way into the heart of almost everyone. And down in Louisiana, the pistol is top gun. Those of us that were close to press could tell how proud he was of Pete. And behind Pete's back, he would just say glorious things about Pete. He would never tell Pete that he was that great. Part of what Pete was searching for was his father's approval, and I don't think he got it very often. He was so obsessed by the boy and his talent that he would take the films home and would play them over and over and over and over and over again all night. They had strong wills, short fuses, and on the court at timeouts, they'd chew each other out. Press usually won, but Pete would go out after a timeout and do something so spectacular, the old man would throw up his hands and say, you know, what can I do? I remember one game in particular during a timeout where Press said, we're going to do this, and Pete said, well, why don't we try that? And he basically ended up, you know, smacking him on top of the head and said, Pete, he said, I'm the coach, you're the player, we're going to do it the way I say to do it. While Pete interacted with his father on the basketball court, his mother, Helen, was finding it increasingly difficult to live in the shadow of their mutual obsession. She was agoraphobic, which is she was afraid of crowds and afraid to leave the house. I was in school four years with, with Press as the coach, the four years he was at State, all four years, and probably saw Helen a half a dozen times. She, she most of the time didn't even come to games. The sad thing about that was when she was in public, she was just absolutely marvelous. A wonderful lady, but she just, I think, crawled within herself. Well, his uh, mother was an alcoholic. I don't think uh, anybody identified that problem at the time. Nobody talked about that problem at the time, but uh, you could put things together. Press had a hard life because he'd go on the road with the LSU team and come back and, and the house is in disarray. She was a lonely woman because her husband and her son were basketball. That was it. They were always involved in basketball. I used to find it in the washing machine. I had a bottle of scotch in the, down in the washing machine or in the dryer. I think it made him mad. And I think it, it frustrated my dad too. Part of it was they were so happy and I guess it upset them that she was not so, she was just so unhappy. Pete became more consumed with basketball. He withdrew from the family. He avoided Helen. Knowing the problems that his mother had, I was concerned and other players were concerned as to whether or not Pete would overindulge in his drinking to where it could become a problem. You would wake up in the morning to go to class and go out there and see how did he get his car in this spot. You could almost sense and feel him hitting the front bumper and then backing up to the back bumper and front bumper and back bumper until he gets in. He drank a lot when he was in college was the reports we were getting, a couple of wrecks. And, of course, you know, his daddy wasn't going to kick him off the team, but he might bat him around a little bit. You know, if you're going to go out and do something really crazy or stay out and make sure Pete's with him, you, you know, probably wouldn't get kicked off for the severe punishment. However hard Pete played off-court, he never let up once the whistle blew, averaging 44 points a game in his sophomore and junior years. But scoring was only part of the Pistols' arsenal. We felt like his ball handling and his assist abilities overshadowed his scoring abilities. And that sounds crazy when a guy averages 40-some points a game. So we made the decision that we were going to play him straight up 
and guard the heck out of the rest of the people. Coach Rupp didn't think that Pete could beat us all by himself, and so we would play him one-on-one. -on -one. The six games that we played against each other uh, in college, I think Pete averaged over 50 points a game, but we won all six games, so Coach Rupp was right. Managing just three victories the season before Pete's arrival on the varsity, LSU played a combined two games above 500 during his first two seasons. As he entered his senior year, Maravich was just under 700 points short of Oscar Robertson's NCAA scoring record. More and more people wanted to be around him, wanted to be a part of him, wanted to talk to him, wanted to get his autograph, just wanted to get as close to him as they could. He really started becoming a loner. He quit going to class. He basically, for all practical purposes, moved out of the dorm, just wanted to be by himself. On the floor, Pete stayed on pace. In the second half against Ole Miss in late January of 1970, the pistol was a point short of the Big O. There must have been 50 photographers at the game. And every time he would you know, shoot the ball, all these cameras would go off. And he must have missed six or seven in a row before he finally made the shot that broke the record. And when he did, it was just, you know, it was an unbelievable huge burden off his back. We were there to create magic, and he was there to create magic, and he created it that night. Leading LSU to a 22-10 and 10 record, Maravich broke his own Division I record by averaging 44 and a half as a senior. He finished his college career with 3,667 points. Well, what I do every year in my first notes column of the year is, is I just remind people of what Pete Maravich did, that he averaged 44 points a game for three seasons. And I don't think people understand what that number is, and, and that's a number that will never be approached ever again in college basketball. I think without a doubt, he was the greatest offensive player ever to play the game. If you want to break his record, that was with no three-point shot. All you have to do is score 15 three-pointers every game you play your entire college career and you'll break Pistol's record. No one's ever going to do it. As the all-time college scoring champion, Maravich would face a new challenge in the NBA without his father on the sidelines. We are most happy to announce that Pete Maravich will play professional basketball for the Atlanta Hawks. Outmaneuvering the ABA's Carolina Cougars, the Hawks signed the collegiate sensation for five years at nearly $2 million. But it wasn't only money that set Maravich apart. When I first came here and uh, announced the starting lineups the first time, uh, I got about three death threats because the people were complaining because I just mentioned black guys. Well, those are guys who were starting. But once Maravich arrived, the color green became the dominant issue. My reaction was thank God for Pete Maravich. Over the six years that I was in the NBA, they told all of us that if you were 6'5 and under, you can't make any money. So at the time, Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain was the only two guys that were making money. When Pete came in, he changed the whole pay structure. Buoyed by Maravich's deal, Caldwell applied for a serious raise. I tried to explain to Joe that John Barrymore was a better actor than John Wayne. But John Wayne was paid more because he drew more fans. I understand the system said you, you got to have a so-called white superstar. That, that stuff should have went out when, when, when the civil rights movement ended. I don't believe it would have made any difference, particularly what color he was. Don't take away from Pete's ability by introducing the color. Joe Caldwell jumped. He went to Carolina where there was a lawsuit and this and that and the other thing because he wanted more money, couldn't get the money. There was grumblings about it. So it, there was an unrest that was starting because they wanted some money. Here's a white kid who hasn't played a day as a pro, making more than triple the salary of anyone else on that team. And it caused some dissent. They didn't have $60,000 to pay Lenny Wilkins. They couldn't pay me $50,000, but yet still didn't get Peter Million. So is that race or what? Unfortunately, Peter Maravich was, uh, in my opinion, the great white hope here in Atlanta. And I think I, that hurt him tremendously because his teammates, for the most part, were black and were ter terrific guys. But when they got Pete Maravich, it was like he was going to do it all by himself. They got along with Pete great off the court. On the court, they had some problems with him because 
you had a 3 one break, Pete might go down and give it behind the back and go out of bounds, and, you know, they're running down the court trying to get a layup, and so they got testy sometimes with Pete. I would have liked to have seen Pete sacrifice a little bit more for the team during the course of his uh, professional career because I think his teams would have had greater success and he would have had greater success. The ball didn't get to him as often as it did on other teams and frankly there was a little cleat that kept the ball away from him when he played with the Hawks. I think they felt like Pete probably got a little more publicity and press, especially uh, in favor in Atlanta, because Atlanta was a predominantly white southern city. I can't believe it. His hair is still dry. It's still thick. It's still natural. His hair goes up. Incredible! That's just got to be the best hair in the league. Despite his national following and 24-point average, Maravich wasn't adding wins to Atlanta's effort to upgrade. Although they had reached the Western Division Finals the year before he arrived, the Hawks never won a playoff round in his four seasons. It seemed that without his father to guide him, Maravich was drifting. Pistol idolized Press Maravich. So you better be very careful and never once say, well, now, you shouldn't do it that way. What if Press had told him to do it that way? And there would be points where he would go, you know, three, four, five games, passing up wide open shots when he should have shot the ball. It was more management handling of the situation than it was the personal relationship between the players. Nobody could tell Pete anything. If, uh, if Pete did something, then uh, it was, they would take care of it. If he would have been more disciplined within his own life, not just in basketball, he'd have been way ahead of the game. But at this point, this was a troubled, angry, difficult to coach Pete Maravich, who also would uh, take out his sorrows, you know, in alcohol. I don't think Pistol could ever drink. In my opinion, two beers, and you have to get Pistol off the wall. He was a very uh, carefree guy, probably drank more than he should have during his playing career. In February of 1974, Maravich boiled over after being ejected from a game in Houston for arguing with an official. In about the middle of the night, I get a call. I need to go up in the hallway where he's staying very frustrated about his game, about a lot of things. Next day, everything was fine, except uh, he, he was a little bit wild on the plane, too. And I had no other choice but to suspend him. Cotton came to me at that point and said, you know, we got to start thinking about making a, a move here. Well, I started doing that very quietly. And, uh, you know, it was very, very interesting. There was no interest. Interest did come from the New Orleans Jazz when the NBA expanded to 18 teams. The pistol was going home. There was no bigger draw, certainly not in Louisiana, than, than Pete Maravich. As long as Pete was here, they always called him the Louisiana Purchase. Pete then says, um, what did you get for me? And I told him, trying not to be too elated, but I reeled off the picks we were going to get, laid the whole package. And there was a little pause, and Pete said, is that all? While Maravich was drawing crowds to the Superdome, Press had slipped into coaching obscurity. Fired by LSU in 1972, Press, now in his third season at Appalachian State, watched over his wife's downward slide. Press did everything he could to help her alcoholism and to help her get over it. I remember the day very vividly where he came in the office and was very upset when she went back to alcohol. He had that contract and he had plenty of money and he was trying to help her and get her straightened out. It just seemed not to be working out and it was kind of frustrating to him. I uh, kept waiting for my wife to come home and she didn't and I said, well, that's not like her. She's, she must be overseeing Helen. And I called over there, and, um, and actually a policeman answered the phone. They said Helen Maravich shot herself, and she was on the way to the hospital. Three hours later, Helen Maravich was pronounced dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She was 49. I saw a difference after his mother passed away. I saw a difference in pistol. I saw a, a serene, almost kind of a lost individual. It was all the pressure that was placed upon him that wanted to chase him away from the game. He didn't know if it was worth it anymore. In 1974, New Orleans celebrated the arrival of Pete Maravich as though he were a native son. Once the people in this market saw Pete play, they suddenly became fans. It was like Baton Rouge all over again. 
if the Jazz on the home games got 100 points, your ticket coupon would get you free french fries. When it would be late in the game and it got up in the 90s, man, people would be yelling, pistol, 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 free fries, free fries, free fries. And so every time they come down the court, they'd give the ball to Maravich and he'd shoot it. After adjusting to the vastness of the Superdome, Maravich averaged over 21 points and six assists in his first season with the Jazz. His game was beginning to mature. I think somehow instinctively he'd started to figure out that we were pretty good players. We were a better team when he wasn't doing as much. And there were a lot more nights where he would be, you know, eight for 14, score 25 points with some free throws, and we'd win by 10. What he did in the second year that I had him, changed his socks, shaved his beard, put a new number on, threw bounce passes, played defense on guys that if you put him on the right guy, played the game of basketball. It was the first year he made first team all pro and he deserved it. But the pistol could still deliver showtime performances. Both guns were blazing on February 25th, 1977. When you can use uh, Walt Frazier and the Knickerbockers like your private tool, uh, that's fabulous stuff. Boy, he's got all kinds of moves. What moves doesn't this guy have? He just went off that night. It was the most amazing thing I'll ever remember seeing as a player. Pistol fire! Oh, come on, come on! 68 for Maravich! Only Will Chamberlain and Elgin Baylor had ever scored more in a game. After leading the league with a 31-point average that season, Maravich and the Jazz were in the hunt for the 1978 playoffs when Pete was brought down. The outlet pass came to Pete at midcourt and took one bounce behind his back and then raised his leg and flipped it through his legs, perfect, down at the other end to, to, uh, to Aaron James for a layup. And when he did, he came down oddly on the knee and you could hear the crack like a rifle shot along the first few rows of the stadium. He had to have knee surgery and it ended his season and the injury probably was the main reason the Jazz never were able to stay in New Orleans because I believe had they made the playoffs that year it might have taken off to a point where the franchise wouldn't have moved and would have stayed in New Orleans. In 1979, hindered by a knee brace, Maravich appeared in just 49 games, averaging 23 points before diminishing crowds. When the Jazz moved to Utah after the season, Maravich had worn out his welcome. I don't think anyone disliked him, but they could see that his game just wasn't you know, what it used to be as a player. And he ended up sitting on the bench, not getting as much time. When you're a legend, it kind of eats at you, and I think it ate at Pete quite a bit. I think he was disillusioned after he got his knee hurt. His own alcoholism was at work. Alcoholism is a disease, and Pete had access to his drug of choice and he had free time. There was an unfortunate situation after the game in Seattle where he had over imbibed and went to the wrong room and started knocking on the door, kicking in the door, and it was the wrong person. He, it wasn't his room. Then it was decided it was best for Pete to move on and he got together with the ownership and management of the team and worked out a settlement with his contract. He was waived and picked up by the Boston Celtics. Joining the Celtics in January of 1980, Maravich came off the bench to help them post the best record in the NBA. He totally impressed me uh, coming in because I thought he was mainly an offensive player. But he worked hard on the defensive end and that, that totally blew me away. If we didn't win, those last couple games, we would not be uh, in first place in the uh, division. And Pistons just took over the game and shot us into the best record. After the Celtics lost to the 76ers in the Eastern Conference Finals, Maravich took a hard look at what was left of his NBA future. At the very, very end of his career, uh, Maravich, you know, began to pass and to relate to other members of the team. But by that time, uh, his, his skills had eroded too far. It wasn't Pete Maravich anymore. NBA people far more knowledgeable than I say that if Pete Maravich had gone to the Boston Celtics out of college, that the Celtics and Red Arbach and the rest of that group would have made him into a team player and he might have been the greatest player of all time. He goes back to Boston and he realizes that he's not going to start. He's not going to be perhaps even the number two shooting guard on that team. So he's going to be on the bench and he admitted it. His ego was crushed. 
On September 20th, 1980, Pete Maravich, at 33, announced his retirement in Boston and returned to his home outside New Orleans. According to Pete, these were the darkest two years of his life. He basically holed up in the house. He was incredibly depressed, and he spoke about it as if he was a drug addict going through withdrawals. And the withdrawal was the attention and the love that he had for basketball. It didn't play out. He didn't become a grand old man of basketball as a player because I think he just couldn't sustain it. He needed to go off and, uh, you know, find some other personality. But Pete Maravich was about to be released from his demons. How he gained his freedom would surprise all who knew him. In 1982, the depressed son of a basketball father found someone else to believe in. Pete Maravich believes that God spoke to him audibly. And he said that from that day on for the rest of his life. And I was getting ready to go off my bed, and God spoke to me. He spoke to me audibly, and he said, be strong, and lift thine own heart. It reverberated through my room. I'll never forget it as long as I live, just like I'm speaking in this microphone. He was not in my spirit. He was outside. He had not come in yet. God spoke to us personally, and a lot of people can't understand that. I don't understand it, but he spoke to us audibly. I'm saying, come on, Pete. He says, oh, I promise you, Bob. I was woken by a sound. It was the Lord speaking to me. And at that time, he dedicated his life to the Lord. He found that, and he was more devoted to that than anything I've ever seen, basketball included. Once he became a Christian, he would read his Bible hours at a time, every day. He would go up and talk with anybody then, where before he thought everybody was coming to talk to him all the time. And he was always trying to convert somebody to Christianity. Pete also helped his father find religion. Together, they continued their passion at the Pistols basketball camp in Clearwater, Florida. He was ready to go at 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, you know he shut it down at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. So he was working 18 and 19 hour days, had a hand in every part of the camp. He had a big salad bar, lots of watermelon, no soft drink, no ice cream, no sugar. That was the good diet for Pete. And uh, we did that while he was at our camp those five years. Then, in 1986, Pete learned that his father was diagnosed with cancer. He was going to do everything humanly possible to try to cure Press. He did not leave Press aside. He was with his dad probably the last six months of his life, literally, day and night. He had some comfort about the fact that uh, he was the one that had been used to bring Press to a place of peace in Press's life. Press Maravich died on April 5th, 1987. Nine months later, he was followed by his son. On January 5th, 1988, Pete Maravich was scheduled to be interviewed for a Christian radio program. But first, there was a pickup basketball game at the First Church of the Nazarene Gym in Pasadena, California. I knew that he had really come through a difficult time in his life, and uh, there'd been a dramatic change in his life when he met Jesus Christ. And uh, I really wanted to hear him tell that story, but I had not met him until that uh, morning at 7 o'clock uh, when we uh, met at the gym to play basketball. I think he was going about half speed, but there was a move or two that he made that took our breath away. We played uh, about three games, and, uh, and at that time, uh, some of the guys wanted to get a drink of water, some went outside to get some fresh air, and before I knew it, it was just Dr. Dobson and Pete on the court, and I was underneath the basket rebounding for Pete as the two of them talked. He said, you know, I've loved being here today. He said, I, I've really got to get back into basketball, even if it's pickup stuff like this. And I said, uh, how do you feel today? And I promise you his last words to me were, I feel great. I just feel great. And I turned to walk away. And I, I don't know why, but I looked back at him for some reason, just in time to see him fall. And he fell hard. He didn't break his fall. I mean, his face hit the boards. I walked over very carefully along with Dr. Dobson, thinking that Pete was going to jump in our faces, but as soon as we got close, we could see his eyes rolling back and the color in his face starting to change. And then I saw that he was in a seizure, and I got down over him, and uh, I held his tongue and kept his air passage open for about 20 seconds. 
and then he just he just writhed once like that his body moved once and it was gone the man died in my arms and I'll never forget that very morning that as that ambulance went over to St. Luke's Hospital in Pasadena, California, the siren wasn't going, there was no red lights, no sound, and it wasn't going very fast. And as tears poured down my face, I kept saying, no, no, but down deep I knew. And it wasn't more than 20 minutes before the doctor came out and said, I'm sorry, guys. Pistol Pete Maravich, the all-time scoring champ of college basketball who spent 10 years in the pros, died as he lived playing basketball. He was only 40 years old. It wiped me out. I was out, out of, I was out of it for about six months, I think, in another, another dimension. Because really, that's all I had was Pete. It just doesn't make sense that a guy could go through the rigors of an NBA game, let alone an NBA season, uh, and not manifest any kind of symptoms at all and then all of a sudden, in a pickup game, have it explode. At autopsy, he had only one coronary artery. Now, generally, you have two coronary arteries, but he was able to play professional and college basketball at the highest possible levels with no symptoms and no problems until much later in life. If you do remember some of Pete's background, there was some alcohol use at certain parts of his life. The official autopsy says that the single coronary artery led to uh, some of the problems, but I think there'll always be a debate about that. Maravich left behind his wife Jackie and their two sons, Joshua and Jason, who represented their father at the NBA's 50th anniversary ceremony in 1997, honoring the league's 50 greatest players. Charles Barkley is the one that sticks it sticks out most in my mind. He's the one that came up, pulled me and my brother to the side, told us Dad would have been real proud of us. I've only met Pete Maravich one time in my life, and he says, you know what, you were my favorite player. And I wanted to make sure to let them know that I acknowledged that and I appreciated that. That's uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever got. Most artists, when they are living, people don't recognize them and recognize their great talent until after they're gone. And I think this is what really happened to beat Maravich. It seems like to me everybody wants to dwell on the sad times or the press time. He had a good life. He had a great life. He did what he wanted. He played basketball. That was his love. And he ended up with his second love, his wife. And then he had his kids. And then he found Jesus. I think he died a happy person. If he was alive today, he would probably be walking down Bourbon Street handing out leaflets for Jesus. If he got one person out of a thousand, he'd be happy. Hauntingly, Pete Maravich foretold his own end. In 1974, he said to a reporter, I don't want to play 10 years and then die of a heart attack when I'm 40. Yet that's exactly what happened. He might not have had the world on a string, but he sure had a basketball there. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.